Hey, this is Dave Spector with Fret 12's Blues and Beyond, and we're here today at Victoria Amplifiers in Naperville, just outside of Chicago, with its founder and CEO, Mark Baer. Hello, people. We make things loud here, <laughs> in a good way. Hey, Mark, one of the questions I wanted to follow up on that you touched on earlier was when you were talking about you know, Leo Fender abandoning his tweed circuitry mm -hmm. in 59 or 60 and mm -hmm. switching over to black faces. I'm really curious just generally to know your your opinion and, and what you think about the differences between tweed amps and blackface amps. Sure, sure, and it's an important distinction. I think it's one that guitar players need to understand really to help them fit them in an amp more correctly. I think the place to start is to realize that in back in the 1950s when Leo Fender was building amplifiers, they were building amplifiers that they, for more than just guitars, they didn't know whether or not a microphone or an accordion, or a guitar, or a bass guitar, we're going to be plugged into the amplifiers. And so to that end, the amplifiers, by necessity, had a very wide bandwidth, which they reproduced correctly. Uh, the the, the Tweed-era amps were adapted from popular public address circuits, which were public domain electronic circuits that were published by the telephone company, by Western Electric. As I said, to that end, they had a very wide bandwidth. They had a rich low end, a very rich mid-range and extension into the high end. The problem is that the lower the frequency, the harder it is for the system to reproduce. So low fre what this means is that lower frequencies distort sooner. So by the 1950s, the late 1950s, there was a need for louder, distortion-free guitar amplifiers. Now because of the Tweed Amp's rich bandwidth, that rich bandwidth contributed to their early onset of distortion. So what they did, they made a critical, they did two critical things with the amplifiers in the early 1960s. The first is to change the electronic circuitry to eliminate the low end and the mid-range frequencies in the tone controls of the amplifier. The effect this has is eliminating the frequencies that are the quickest to distort so that the frequencies that reach Everything after the tone controls, the output transformer, the power tubes, the speakers, now those, those components are reproducing a signal that is, does not have those frequencies which are going to contribute to early distortion. So the, 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 I, I guess the quick way to understand this is that by eliminating the, the mid-range, you've left the frequencies, the high end, which are going to be crisp and non-distorted. So what it gives you is an amp that is louder and cleaner. Mm -hmm just by eliminating these things in the frequency spectrum. So that when you listen to a tweed basement next to a 410 Super Reverb, the Super Reverb is always going to be brighter, no matter where you set the controls. And it's because that's by design. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the other key difference between the tweed era amps and the blackface era amps is the cabinet. Back in the 1950s, the cabinetry was very loose, very resonant. Mm -hmm. And because of this, vibrated, okay? Some of the, the energy that the speakers produce, the mechanical energy that the speakers producing, work to vibrate the camera, uh, the camera, <laughs> the cabinet. In the tweed era, what they did was make the cabinets much tighter and much stiffer, eliminating the kind of psychoacoustic, if that's a word, interaction. All the cabinet vibration in a blackface amp has been eliminated. Now what this means is that the energy that is moving speakers, more of that energy goes to moving air. None of the speaker energy is dissipated into the cabinet. Mm -hmm. So that you're left with more raw energy to push air in the speakers. Now the sonic manifestation is, you not only have a louder amp, but you have a much tighter, stiffer, more directional amp. The blackface amp is much more beamy and directional. And this is because of the tightness and the stiffness of the cabinet. What materials were they using? Well, they were using plywood, but uh, and and later on in the sixties, they started using a um, pressed uh, fiberboard, MDF type stuff. And what were they using in the fifties? They were using plywood. But they were using a lighter, a, a, a thinner gauge. For instance, the, one, one of the critical components is the baffle board, which is what the the board that that, that the speakers are mounted to. This is the baffle board. In the fifties, that baffle board was five sixteenths of an inch thick. That's very thin, and it it, it it's very resonant. Um, in the 60s, at the blackface era, they were using three-quarter inch MDF, mm -hmm. which is just tight and yeah. stiff. Yeah. 
And again, the, there, there's a real good reason for doing that in that you're, the energy that's, like I said, the energy that's created by the speaker now is pushing air rather than vibrating the cabinet. But it's the principal reason that a blackface amp is absolutely needs reverb in order for that amp to open up and to be a more musical instrument, is that that reverb opens up that stiff, tight cabinet. And that's, that, that's really why, if, if you take a blackface amp and turn the reverb off, they're almost unplayable. Mm -hmm. That, that, that's the main difference. But the, really, the reason was the, the desire for more headroom, mm -hmm. which, which is more clean volume. And the easiest way to do that is to eliminate the frequencies that distort the soonest. And that there's your distinction. And it's an important one. You know?